Certainly looking at uh, Japan and China and the race for number two, it does remind you uh, of the story of the tortoise and the hare. Um, of course, the tortoise and the hare was a morality tale about how slow and steady would win the day, uh, about the consistency in approach to uh, completing a task. Whereas when we look at Japan and China, we can see the characteristics of both. Obviously, at the moment, Japan would largely be viewed as the tortoise. It's a very large economy. It's quite slowly moving. The demographics of the economy certainly aren't favorable to growth. And it also has the characteristics of the tortoise in terms of its decision making. Economic policy is very slowly enacted. The ability for the economy to turn quickly is also extremely slow. Whereas when we look at China, China is clearly more like the hare. It's been an economy that's been growing very, very rapidly for an extended period of time. However, it doesn't have the indecision uh, or the distractions that we saw uh, in the morality tale. In fact, when we look at China, its policy is also implemented at a rapid speed. And this is one of the key dynamics that has driven Chinese outperformance over the course of the post-subprime crisis. Being a centrally planned or managed economy, China can implement policy very, very quickly. Uh, economists normally talk about the lags with which monetary and fiscal policy work, particularly for fiscal policy when a developed economy such as the US moves to a fiscal stimulus um, uh, package, you have the initial lag, which is the recognition of the problem. You then have the second lag, which is designing and uh, implementing the policy to respond to that problem. And then you have your third lag, which is the lag it takes to actually um, uh, undertake these projects to mobilize the resources to build new railways or highways. And it ends up that the lags in developed economies mean that policy often becomes pro-cyclical. By the time uh, the problem has been recognized, a policy has been designed and implemented, the economy is already in its upswing thanks to monetary policy, and the fiscal policy response becomes pro-cyclical. What you see in China, however, is entirely different. China can mobilize resources very, very quickly. Uh, if you look at uh, Beijing International Terminal Airport number one, uh, which is um, the largest, uh, one of the largest airports in the world, you could fit Heathrow terminals one, two, three, four, and five uh, under its roof. That was built in three years, and it was simply because China can mobilize physical and capital resources extremely quickly. And that is what we saw in November 2008. China made a very conscious policy decision that the global financial crisis of the time was going to permanently reduce uh, the external demand that was coming from the US and Europe. And what we have seen in China's response that it has spent the equivalent of export share uh, boosting the domestic economy. We see a very strong fiscal stimulus package continuing to work. We continue to see a very heavy infrastructure and investment growth-led model. And that certainly will see China overtake Japan to become the number two economy uh, in the world this year. But that's not really um, the question, or it's not really the point of the discussion. Because for some time, we've already seen China be the number one economy in the global economy for many, many years. And the first way China has been number one has been its contribution to growth. Uh, we have seen some estimates that uh, over the period 2000 to 2010, uh, China would have accounted for around 75% of the increase in global growth over that period. Uh, whereas Japan has been an economy that has essentially moved sideways for the past two decades. And what we see is it's the delta or the year-on-year -year change in China's growth that becomes 
very important for the global economy. Uh, if you have an extremely large population of around 1.3 billion people, um, we have to look at the dynamics of the change in the marginal incomes and the marginal spending behaviours of that population. And though many people talk about the emergence of the Chinese consumer as the key dynamic to watch in the next decade, uh, and many European companies in particular um, sort of eagerly await this arrival of the Chinese consumer, we have to remember that uh, the average income in China is only 3,000 US dollars per annum per capita. Uh, assuming you have income growth of around 10% a year, which is a reasonable assumption for China, your delta is about $300. So if income is going up by $300, the spending patterns you see uh, tend to be fairly basic. So a little bit more spending on food, a little bit more spending on consumers. These changes are not sufficient to launch the Chinese consumer into the luxury goods space. Your average um, income earner in China is not going to rush out and buy a new BMW uh, or a new Citron uh, with their $300 of extra income. So when we look at the delta, uh, we tend to find that it is favoring a shift in basic goods consumption. We're seeing the consumption basket globally become one driven more by non-durable goods. And I think when we look for the spillovers from the China dynamic, that increasingly is spilling over into the Asian economies, particularly the emerging Asian economies, and to the commodity exporters in the world. But I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, a little bit later. Uh, what I wanted to go through first was the way Asia is currently uh, emerging. and where we see Asia uh, being in the future. Now, if we look back at the global economy uh, just 10 years ago in 2000, in the top uh, right corner of this chart, um, we can see that even then Japan accounted for 60% of Asia's GDP growth. And uh, Japan had gone through its first lost decade the 1997 to 2000 recession is widely considered to be Japan's deepest and most severe. This is when we first started to see the deflation uh, in the goods sector as opposed to the asset sector of the economy. And even after that woeful decade, Japan still accounted for 60% of Asia's GDP. China only accounted for 15% of GDP. If we move into 2007, which is sort of widely considered, um, you know, the, the, the peak of the uh, Asia growth model, uh, we find that Japan's share of the region's GDP had shrunk to just 40% uh, by this time, whereas Japan had rapidly expanded to 30%. But if we want to look at the future, and again, we're using 2007 as our base year, as it was the year before the, um, uh, the, the financial crisis, uh, the year when we really did see um, you know, Asia uh, starting to, to, to come into its own in terms of autonomous demand. If we look at the contribution uh, to growth, so how much of growth in the region each economy was responsible for, we find China accounted for 60% of the region's growth, India 21%, and Japan accounted for around 1% of the region's growth. Now, we do believe that these are the types of growth drivers you are going to see uh, continuing uh, probably over the next uh, four to five years. And Japan is going to make a very small contribution to both the region's gr growth uh, and also global growth, whereas the lion's share of regional growth and also global growth is going to come from China. Now, many people are sort of asking the question, will China overtake Japan to become number two? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, in fact, when we look at um, what's happening with China and India over a longer time frame, uh, we find that China and India are actually both moving 
to reclaim their 